can talk about dilemma, which is part of your tools. Yeah, and that would be pretty much what I go to next. Because the way that I work with dilemma is I'm looking at that right from the outset in developing the story. Like you can see that even as I'm playing with this broad array of possibilities for this story, I keep coming back to, well, if the robot had been programmed to do this and, you know, like what's unacceptable to the robot and what might be equally unacceptable and, you know, how does that, how is that impacted by commands that are given by the robot's operating system, um, by the robot's sense of morality? One of my favorite quotes, which I thought about for a flickering second about a half an hour ago, uh, it's by a writer, George Saunders. And he says, um, character is the governing element of life and is above genius. And real character is something that's very important and mere genius is just some other smart dude who could be completely crazy, but he's wicked smart and it's like, but he's destructive or, you know, it's like, it's, it's just genius. Uh, you know, like kind of like throw a stick and you can hit a genius, but half of them are screwed up. You know, character is, is substantial. And that could be something that the robot is really wrestling with. And I really like the, the image of Data, the character who's, I think it had a positronic brain. It was absolute state-of-the-art computer technology built into an Android. I don't know if it synthesized human and robot or if it's just a pure machine. But his hunger for humanity and curiosity about aspects and foibles of humanity is intriguing. It was something, you know, I haven't seen that show in many, many years, but I always liked Data. And I remember one show, he even became human for a half an hour in the holodeck or something like that. But at the end of it all, he understands what a joke is. And he's like, oh, that's funny. Even though he's no longer in the mindset that had him acting really like a human. Spock did that sometimes too, where he would become more like a, an impulsive wild animal than a rigidly controlled logician. And he'd you know, go into these different states and be goofy and wacky and funny and all that stuff. So just in terms of focusing on trapping this automaton in a dilemma of magnitude, a dilemma that matters to the audience, there's a lot of raw material for that here. And <clears throat> it seems as though there might be altruism on one side, like it's unacceptable to give up a sense of what's right, of doing the right thing, of being able to, being capable of doing really powerful, world-changing things. Someone who's kind of like was raised to be a brain surgeon and like, they're really trying to do good for people and that's built into who they are and why they operate. So that's an interesting thing to kind of just sit there and let it float like the need to do good, a moral compass and even just a moral compass 
knowing what's right and what's wrong. Um, so then to countermand that or to be the opposite of that, but equal, because you want equally unacceptable alternatives, that's where you get that Robbie the robot short circuiting in between two things. If one, if one side of the, of the dilemma is more unacceptable than the other, then you have a path of least resistance and electricity will always take the path of least resistance. But if you have equal resistance, then you block it, you have impedance and it heats up uh, in electricity. So I know what this automaton looks like caught in this dilemma because it looks literally like Robbie the robot short circuiting. Like it can't, it's like eh, 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 unable to process command. And so I know that I want to achieve that, but it's a question of what are the two alternatives that are being sort of not just posed to this automaton, but sort of foisted onto this automaton, forced like Sophie's choice. It's not like, oh, that'll be a fun choice. Which kid do I sacrifice? It's horrible. It's, it's like, I don't want any of this. But it may, it may not be that extreme, but we want something substantial of magnitude that really impacts an audience and you want not only magnitude, a dilemma that matters to the audience, but you want it to where the audience can relate to it personally. And that's an important aspect of working with dilemma because if you're trapping a protagonist in a dilemma and the average person in the audience can understand it intellectually but has no emotional connection to it, then they're like, I see what they're talking about, but I don't care. So one of the questions I'm always asking my students is once you have a dilemma trapped between two equally unacceptable alternatives, can the average member of the audience connect to that? And so what I say is like, you know, pick somebody who like lives down the street that you don't even know and sort of study them indirectly. You know, they might be someone who's like, you know, a graduate student in dance and really creative and drives Uber at night to make ends meet. And it's just a regular person down the street. So you've got your character trapped in this dilemma. Can that person down the street that you don't really know or don't know at all, can they connect to that? Or is it like, because you want your average member of the audience who's just a plumber taking his kids to the movie or whatever, do they see themselves in it? Because if they don't, then they're less connected to it. And they say that the deeper you go, the more universal you get. So if the movie you know, is about you know, a contractor in France who's caught up in a tricky situation, it should be so that like, you know, a doctor in Australia can watch that movie and go, I don't know anything about building houses, but his dilemma of like duty versus honor or something like that, like I can totally relate to that. So it's like what we want as we work with developing a dilemma for this automaton is to make it so that the average member of the audience looks at that dilemma and goes, wow, I'm caught in the same dilemma. It's a different set of circumstances, but I'm caught in that exact same thing and I don't know how to get out of it. Maybe this robot can f solve the thing that's paralyzing me in a fundamental way. Then the audience cares that much more and it's a visceral connection, it's an emotional connection, not just an intellectual understanding. It's interesting to try to trap this robot in a real quandary. They do a decent job of that in the Will Smith movie, I, Robot. Will Smith hates robots because they tore off his arm at one point. He's a cop. 
the head of this huge corporation gets thrown off a 30-story landing and Will Smith is brought in to investigate and everybody thinks this robot killed the master. But And Will Smith hates that suspect robot from the beginning because he's prejudiced against all robots. He hates them all. But he begins to perceive that the robot that is under suspicion has unique insights and is the total opposite of what he thought. Um, and, it's at the, and that robot was actually reprogrammed by the old man before he was killed. And that robot is there to help Will Smith stop the robot corporation from doing something treacherous. I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it's a robot army that they're unleashing on the world to control them. But it's interesting because because that robot is either raising interesting questions in Will Smith's mind or Will Smith is raising interesting questions in the robot's mind. I can't recall, but that's just a movie I've seen that has similarities to this type of potential story. And like I can feel the presence of the dilemma, even if I'm not able to articulate it clearly at this point, because I'm still kind of inventing what these two equally unacceptable alternatives could be. But I know, I know how that robot feels trapped in that type of situation. I have an emotional connection to what that does to this robot. And so as I sort of try to conjure what these things might be, <clears throat> it can be helpful to look ahead to the point of crisis where the dilemma comes to a critical juncture around the three quarters point in the movie around the end of act two because we want the dilemma to kick in somewhere around the end of act one, where we've, we've gotten to know the main character, the story's developed. And as, as the story gets up to speed, like the full complexity of the story is all kicking in, we want this robot to be trapped in this dilemma of magnitude, either before the end of act one or by the end of act one. And we want that dilemma to extend throughout act two where the dilemma goes critical. Prior to that, the robot is like, I can't pick in either direction. And the same with Jay Coit in Training Day. I can't let go of this opportunity, but I can't do what Alonzo is trying to get me to do. Uh, and so that dilemma is going to go critical around the end of Act Two. And then the protagonist has to make a decision about the dilemma and take an action about it now that it's gone critical. And then the ending of the story is the resolution of the dilemma, the active resolution of the dilemma by the protagonist that conclusively resolves the dilemma. So the dilemma is like fully engaged before the end of act one or around the end of act one. It builds an intensity all throughout act two to the point where it reaches this critical juncture that forces the protagonist to make a decision and take an action about the dilemma that he or she couldn't previously decide about. And then the end is the resolution of the dilemma. So the dilemma encompasses most of the proportion of the script. It's not something that happens for five minutes in the story. It's something that takes up most of the story. And if you look at the movie, um, almost famous by Cameron Crowe, he won best screenplay for that. He said, the, the kid who's the reporter, he said, he, he, re, he can't become friends with the band because then he's no longer an objective reporter. And if he does become friends with them, they'll try to make him write about how cool they are. 
So he, he loves this band. It's unacceptable to not become friends with them because they're the coolest creatures around and he's uncool. So he's desperate for that. And yet his mentor, the Philip Seymour Hoffman character says, do not become their friend because they'll make you into a puppet and write about how great they are. You want to be an objective reporter and really stick to your guns on that. And Cameron Crowe said, that dilemma is what the movie's about. And if you look at it again, you can see that constitutes the full proportion of the script. It takes a little bit of time of setup to get to get to know him. He gets in with the band, starts traveling with them. But after he's really in there, he has great opportunities to become friends with them, but he really wants to be a good reporter. So the dilemma is, constitutes much of the proportion of the script. And the way I describe it sometimes is like, it's like a whale in your living room. It doesn't take up every square inch, but it takes up the full thing. You can still walk around it and stuff, but it's not a little thing in the middle of your living room. It's the dilemma is, constitutes the full proportion of the script. So all of that to say that as I work to conjure what these two equally unacceptable alternatives could be that paralyze the protagonist for much of the script. One way to um, see what these might be more clearly is to look ahead to the point of crisis. Like, okay, so at some point, this dilemma is gonna to come to a make or break point, which is very much the gun to the head on the protagonist. Like, you don't get to spend any more time thinking about how you're gonna, what kind of decision you're gonna make about this dilemma. You have to decide now. That's the nature of a crisis. It demands immediate decision and action. And so sometimes looking ahead to what the crisis might look like can help you see what this is by sort of looking through the opposite end of the telescope or seeing it from a different point. So if I'm this robot and I'm trapped and I can really feel these things, I just don't know exactly what they are yet and that's okay. But at some point, there's gonna be a make or break crisis about this dilemma. Yeah, and it's really about morality like versus ambition, I think. Like if the son of the leader is gonna make $8 trillion overnight, I can see the robot feeling morality, but does a robot have that type of ambition? Like does it care about $8 trillion? I don't know, I mean like <clears throat> I have 13 year old girls and they're very aware of money now and like it and are interested. But you know, when they're eight, you know, they get Christmas money or, and we like put it on their desk and they like didn't pay any attention to it. We'd find it like, you know, under a book the next week or they just, they didn't, it didn't mean anything to them yet. So like to what degree might an automaton value this massive amplification of power and possibility and all that, and certainly if it's an AI, then it could certainly have been imbued with characteristics of the owner that growing the company is really important and is important to the survival of the business, even survival of the automaton. If the business gets shut down, then maybe the plug gets pulled on the, autom on the automaton. But it seems as though like being raised by the owner, programmed or created, I don't know if the money is as important as the capability. You know, so is the, is the son <clears throat> telling the robot, look, some people are gonna die 
in the process of this, or maybe the robot comes back and says, you know, this plan you're putting in place, a whole lot of people are going to die. And, you know, maybe the robot hadn't really connected that yet. And the owner is like, well, yeah, but that, you know, that's how progress is often made. And the thing is that if our company achieves this monopoly, then our capability to help so many more people and in other words, appeal to the altruism of the robot or the moral compass or something like that is possible. And you can see I'm just kind of feeling my way along with it. And, you know, I'm not even sure what an ambitious robot even looks like. Uh, but it's programming, it's compulsion, it's, you know, like more, not so much more is better, but more enables more function, more capability, more something. It's puzzling, like I'm not sure. <clears throat> so... But, so I'm not exactly sure what the crisis is, but I can see a sense of what decision and action in the face of crisis might look like. Because the, para the, the crisis breaks the paralysis of the dilemma. It forces a decision and action. And they say, uh, Aristotle said that decision and action in the face of crisis reveals the true character. It strips the mask off. You, like you don't know who your real friends are until you've been through a crisis with them. The classic example is the big strong guy jumps up and runs out screaming. The little guy jumps up and saves the day. So you don't know what people are really made of until they're forced by a crisis to show what they're really made of. And I could see the robot really trying to do the right thing at the point of crisis. But to get to the resolution, which is the resolution, the conclusive proactive resolution of the dilemma by the protagonist, once the robot takes a stand to try to do the right thing at the critical moment, then he's got to fight to the finish with the sun to get through the last 15 minutes of this movie in a real knockdown drag out fight that the robot may well lose. Uh, And there could certainly be a creative resolution for the automaton, but it's going to have to grow and think differently and disobey key things and cleave more closely to key things. Some values that it's been programmed to value, to, to you know, uphold will be shattered and some values that has been programmed to want will be amplified as the way the way people do in real life. So the one thing that's really crystalline is decision and action. I can see the robot is really going to try to do the right thing. Um, so does that inform what the dilemma consists of. Let me just... Sure. And I just thought of something, too, that might be driving the sun, aside from money, and that is notoriety and fame that will come with the, the you know, and he's the, the, the son of this sort of brainchild, and then, you know, he's the, you know, he, maybe social media wasn't around when the father was building the company. And now maybe the son is not 30 yet, and now he'll be the, you know, successful 30 under 30, and so there's all this... Uh, you know, press that he wants. Yeah. And that's also driving him. Yeah. You know. Which is also kind of madness and sure. that kind of stuff, the narcissism and the the need for power. And maybe the father was never around because he was just working 19 hours a day. And the kid has a, you know, a sort of out of proportion need to 
be loved or to impress or to be validated. <clears throat> Maybe, yeah, his whole identity was, um, yeah. I mean, I growing up in the Bay Area, I knew people that their children were, you know, from someone's owned a tech company and that was the first thing out of their mouth and, and it, you know, wasn't always the healthiest dynamics, right. but it was high and my father is so-and-so. And I think that's a very real thing and unfortunately yeah. it just happens. Absolutely. Um, so... Uh, you know, maybe he needs that. It's driving him. And also the social media accolades and the press to be in all of the financial papers. As, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and we want to build complexity into that, but that's where the Enneagram is so useful to dimensionalize that sun in a way where you understand the sun, but you still see him as a monster, but he still has very interesting aspects. And, um, You know, you see up and coming business owners who are really ruthless with their competitors. And then after they make it big, they're like giving money away to everybody. But they destroyed multiple businesses to get there. So it's like, you know, again, it's the, the ambition versus moral compass type thing. Now, the other interesting model for dilemma to try on is something that comes from my knowledge of Tootsie, which is that Michael Dorsey's uh, a male actor who's very talented actor, but a huge pain in the ass to work with. And he's really inept at relating to women. Um, and when he dresses up as a woman and gets hired, all of a sudden he's got a career, a fat paycheck, respect as an actor, and relationships with women that he wasn't capable of doing as Michael now that he's Dorothy. And he sees women from a totally different point of view now that he's Dorothy. And he becomes Dorothy becomes a crusader for women's rights, whereas Michael was kind of the person she'd be crusading against. So, and, and there's all kinds of ways in which becoming Dorothy is disrupting Michael's life in both major and minor ways. So Michael can't let go of Dorothy because it's the best thing that ever happened to him, but he can't keep being her because it's the worst thing that ever happened to him. And it kind of cooked down to like Dorothy is creating him, like literally making him a better person and destroying him, like kind of taking him apart as all these things happen. So I'm like, I want to like try that on for a possibility for this automaton. Is there a way that this situation is offering a lot of potential upscale to the robot and yet is also destroying. Now, here's something that could actually drive a robot or give a robot ambition. So what if <clears throat> we talked about the possibility of the robot regenerating the old man in humanoid form, even if it only is 20 minutes, based on sneaking around to use the equipment in the in the manufacturing facility, kind of like you know the Tyrell Corporation, where they can make people. Um, could the son tell the automaton, "Stick with me and help me pull this off." We'll make eight tr trillion dollars overnight. We'll be worth eighty trillion this time next year, and we'll be getting up towards a quadrillion in five years. Like, boom! Like, we can now move on to the master plan of actually genetically building people, so you, the automaton, could have a human body, and actually walk around and get cut and have BO and go surfing and, you know, get sunburned, like all the things that you've always wanted. See, that's something that could really, like the robot is like, 
I want that. And almost like an out of proportion, irrational, like I'm desperate to have that. Nothing's going to make me let go of that. But I'm also being asked to, look, help execute a billion people with this contagion so that we can sell the cure for it. And that's going to make me human. And so see how I was like, I was feeling around for how can a robot be ambitious? What does he care about? Does money mean anything at all to him? But that like, that's something. And it's, you know, it's Pinocchio, you know, the, the wants to be a real boy. Um, <clears throat> and it taps into data. And it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to come from a place that necessarily makes sense from the outside. So it's not, you look at that from outside and be like, no, that's way more, killing a billion people is way more unacceptable than not becoming human. But if we're dealing with like madness to some degree, this outsized hunger in this automaton to be human, that it's irrational, but it's extremely real for this automaton. And is a really deep, need that really drives this machine that probably has a soul, a conscience, or a personality. Soul is such an ambiguous word, but um, something that might emulate human personality quite well. So it's not missing that but it wants a human body quite a lot. <clears throat> and the sun could even influence the automaton's operating system, like with a virus that makes it like more greedy to be human, sort of take that irrational drive and amplify it. Um, See, now there's, see how I was like, I'm not sure what these are. There's something, there's one of them right there. And yes, it's a real challenge to like, for this one main creature that we like and are rooting for to really want that. We can, we can get behind that. But when we look at it, becoming human versus helping kill a billion people, we're like, it has to be handled right so that we keep rooting for this Android. Uh, because if, if the Android starts going, hum diddy, I can't wait to kill a billion people and eat hot dogs on the beach, we're like, I'm not rooting for this creature anymore. You know, it's like you have to get the audience sympathy, or I think the better word is empathy, because it's not like pity, sympathy infers pity, but audience empathy, like they're really rooting for this character. You have to get the audience empathy and keep it. You can get it and then lose it if you don't handle it right. So this has to be handled right so that the need to become human has some kind of perceived equalness in the mind of this automaton based on this automaton's skewed perception of the world, um, like think of all the things you can do in a body. First of all, maybe that body won't age. You know, we're gonna put you in a body, but 400 years from now, it'll still be 27 and you'll still be the, the best surfer on the beach and like whatever. And you can be brain sir, you can, you, can, you can change the face, you were designed to change the face of humanity even. You know, and these billion people who are gonna die, they're already starving. They're not gonna live that much longer. They're sickly, they're in, you know, it's like, the more that 
the sun can amplify the capabilities of this AI put in a human body that can, you know, last a thousand years versus the fate of these people who are already going to die anyway. It's like, it's like getting somebody with terminal cancer and sending them in as a suicide bomber. It's like there's people that will sign up for that. So if he has to sacrifice people that are demonstrably not going to live that long anyway, then, and he's like, I can help the other 7 billion people who really need my capabilities as a master healer 10 years from now, and I've really incorporated so much more with, with all the wealth that this company can do, then you begin to, it's not like so wildly uneven from this automaton's point of view, even though we can still go, don't be an idiot, you're still killing a billion people. But I think that's also what he's going to discover at the point of crisis, like that the sun's been radically lying to him or something like that, or the, you know, the old man who's back as a human for 20 minutes or whatever is like, he's lying his ass off to you, just like he always did to me. He's a monster. Don't let him get away with this. And then maybe, you know, the son comes in and kills the father again, like, right? Who knows? But um, we have now the elements of a dilemma that have to be managed right but the deep hunger to become human and be a savior in many ways, like an, an intelligence on an order of magnitude beyond any human that ever lived in a human body that, I mean, I, obviously if you like, you know, you can chainsaw it in half, but it's not gonna die from a cold or age or those kind of things. And it's, it's interesting, and it goes back to the, um, the trick of how they catch monkeys in the Philippines, which is that they take a coconut, hollow it out, make a hole the size of a monkey's hand, and put rice inside it, tie it to a tree. The monkey comes along, reaches in there, and grabs the rice, but holding the rice, it can't get its hand back out. And the way they catch it is they just walk up to the monkey and grab it, and it's screaming its head off. It wants to run, but it will not let go of the rice. Like... This android is like, I want life. It's just like what Roy Batty says to Deckard. I want more life, Father. Um, so that's interesting. And if the android has been infected with a virus by the sun that weakens its moral compass, its ethics, its then there's more gray area and less black and white inside that android's ethical choice system. Like where it's starting to agree with the sun. Yeah, you know, I could see where 300 million of those people are literally going to be dead in a week anyway. So that doesn't mess up my android conscience. And, you know, it's like he's, he's able to rationalize, which is weird to say, for a robot, but the more human they become, the more they get better at rationalization. I, I don't remember what movie it was. It might have been Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. Like, did you ever try to go a day without a rationalization? Something like that. That it's key to how people operate. And from my own study of Hamlet, which I was trained on, um, the thing that I found about Hamlet, the more I studied it, was that there was a huge discrepancy between what he says he's going to do, which is everything, and what he actually does, which is virtually nothing, is what gets him and the whole royal family killed. Because his, the ghost of his father says, your uncle killed me, go kill him and make things right. And Hamlet, who's a crown prince, who's been raised as a man of action, that comes right to the front. He says, absolutely, I'll go kill him, no problem. But then the more he thinks about it, he's like, was that a trick of the devil? And he's off at college, studying philosophy, chasing girls, sword fighting, riding horses. He has an ideal life. And he's like, do I really want to give all that up to kill my uncle and become king and be stuck in this 
cold castle with all these shallow backstabbing people around. And so when it comes time to take action, he's not sure if he should and he lets the chance go by him. And then he beats up on himself. He's like, oh, I should have just done it. All right, so next time, next chance, boy, am I going to do it. And then he doesn't do it again, but he is asking all the right questions. But the next chance he gets to do it, he doesn't. And then he's really angry. He's like, okay, now next time, watch out. I'm going to go crazy. I'm really mad now. Nothing's going to stop me. And he screws up yet again. And so the discrepancy between what he says he's going to do which is everything and what he actually does, which is practically nothing, comes down to his ability to lie to himself. It's about self-deception because he believes it when he says, next time I'm really going to do it. But he's lying to himself. And the more I studied Hamlet, the more I grew to hate him because he's really a screw up, like literally a royal screw up. And he's unable to take decisive action in the face of an emergency. And that's why the whole family ends up dying. But his self-deception is the mechanism by which he does that. And everybody has self-deception in varying degrees. And the more that I studied Hamlet and the more I grew to hate him, because I see him as an abject screw up who can't communicate honestly with himself. So if I notice like, Oh, I'm talking about I'm doing this and doing this, but I'm not actually doing it. I'm like, I'm doing a Hamlet. So get rid of the crap and just do it or whatever, but be honest with yourself. And so it brings up an interesting question of like self-deception in a robot as it becomes more human. It's able to lie to itself to help itself get where it needs to. It's like a negative aspect of becoming human. So that's intriguing. And it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic in the story and something that the sun might be able to amplify by the introduction of a virus that's sort of corroding or corrupting his rigid ethics like Robbie the robot cannot disobey an order and cannot harm a human being. You know, if one of those things was being corrupted, then maybe he sort of could disobey a command or something like that. It's, it's an interesting thing to play with. So we still don't have a whole lot of particulars yet, but we have a whole lot more than we did 45 minutes ago. And the 36 dramatic situations just like as I looked at ambition, I'm like, so obviously the sun who we may not have invented by that at that point, the sun could be extremely ambitious, eight billion, eight trillion dollars overnight. What's not to like and all that stuff. And could the robot have ambition? And how does a robot have ambition? And, you know, what are the ambitions of the founding father or something like that? But you could see how just thinking about an automaton, need to steal, medicine, innocent will suffer, treachery and glory, wish granting, looking at ambition through the, lens of the lenses of those raw elements gave rise to several possibilities. And really there was, you know, hundreds of possibilities in, the, in that, but several about ambition jumped right out and grabbed me by the throat. Ambition by the protagonist, the automaton, or ambition by the central villain, the sun. And that gave us like something to actually grab onto instead of just smoke in a bucket where there wasn't really anything you could grab yet. Now we're beginning to have some things out of which we can cobble together a story and we've gradually been Possibilities have been gelling. A few things have started to really solidify. Decision and action even kind of crystallizes. Like I can really see that as a hard, real thing. I don't know what the resolution might be. I'm getting more of a sense. Well, now that we have the possibility of him becoming human and he's like irrationally over-attracted to that, that can counterbalance 
the unacceptability of sacrificing a billion people who were going to die anyway. In other words, it's the ability to lie to yourself. And the virus makes him more manipulable and less rigid. You know, it's like when Spock, you know, gets some alien fungus and he's laying around like he's on catnip instead of going, that's not logical. You know, so we're like playing with interesting things and creating plot devices like corrupting part of the robot's operating system with a virus makes certain things that we're trying to do more tangible and doable rather than uh, I wish we could had a way to corrupt his operating system, that kind of thing.